Well, brother, given or brother, brother, and I give thanks. I'll get it out here in a minute <laughs> for this topic of this weekend. This has so far been uh, a good thing for us to consider this this gem of the immutability of God, and and each of us have this gem, and we're looking at it, and we're looking at it from different facets, but we're also beholding some of the same things as well. And so for us to hear these things again, it is safe. The Lord, we know, has given us these things to consider, and so we have need to hear them, don't we? Brother Ricky's message today is going to be found in Isaiah 46.10. And Isaiah wrote, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Brethren, this is a fit word for our day, or for any day, for that matter, and for our hearing. It is a good word for us to hear this. The Lord has revealed himself in the word of God, and it may appear in the day that we're living that God is not able to do what he has determined to do. It may appear that way. We can see that sometimes maybe in our own personal walk with the Lord or maybe corporately. But the Lord has declared his purpose and his counsel shall stand. Amen. It's already been said so far this weekend that there have been kings and leaders rise and fall in the world that have declared what they will do. But yet they are impotent in bringing to pass exactly what their desire is. <clears throat> And humanity has set up idols that are both unable to declare, they're, they're speechless, they're dumb, they cannot talk, what the end from the beginning is. And in fact, those who worship these false gods have their own ideas of what their God's purpose and desires are. There's not even necessarily a consistent idea of what this God wants to do or is able to do. But God, he is the true God, and he declares his purpose and his counsel shall stand. Why? Why will his counsel stand? Because God is sovereign. He is immutable. Amen. If the truth of the sovereignty of God is skewed, everything else will be skewed. We must, the people of God, must see God as he is. This, this is, this is, we have to do this. If we do not see God as he is, everything else that we look at will be skewed. <clears throat> if you do not believe that God is the ruler over all, then whatever salvation you think you might have is faulty. However, if you see and believe that God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, then what do we have to fear, brethren? In this passage that, we're, that Brother Ricky is going to consider, God is setting himself apart from all other gods. As a matter of fact, in the previous verse, he said, For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. He's setting himself apart. The common thread throughout this weekend is that God is unchanging, nor is he susceptible to changing. He, he, he cannot change. He is over all, and he declares all that he will do. Jesus told us that he is the only true God. Remember in John 17, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He is the only living God, and we see this all throughout the scripture. Amen. David wrote in Psalm, my soul longeth. Yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for a God. No, for the living Amen. God. Amen. Paul told us that take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And again he said, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. Again, God is the only one who can declare his purpose and perfectly fulfill all he declares without even the possibility of being thwarted. Mm -hmm. 
He is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. So whom do you know that can declare their purpose and fully execute it without flaw or without hindrance until that purpose is completed? We say if the Lord wills, we will do, we will do this or that. But the Lord God himself, he will declare it and he will complete it. Isaiah wrote in, in Isaiah 45, 19, I have not spoken in a secret concerning God in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, and I declare things that are right. This is what the Lord has said of himself. So when you take hold, brethren, and you believe that God is and that he's over all, and he is all righteous, and he is right in everything he does, texts like these kindle your hope, and they encourage our faith to grow, and we long more for God. Here are these passages. I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. Or how about when Jesus said, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. You cannot find hope in that kind of thing unless you know that God is and that he is over all. He's declared it and his counsel will stand and he will do all of his pleasure. <clears throat> I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Again, the comforting words from our Savior. How about when we're told that God is a high tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe? Or when God said, I will execute all of my sayings. Everything God has ever said, he will do it. Or salvation is of the Lord. His counsel shall stand. Now when you read this passage, you, you, can, you, can, you can sense the authority that God has in this. It's, it's almost like a thus saith the Lord. This cannot be, this, this isn't a possibility. This is because he has said it. So what is the pleasure of the Lord? Ultimately, it is his righteousness. If his pleasure is to save many people alive, it is right. If his pleasure is to send the word to carry out his pleasure in the likeness of flesh, it is right. If his pleasure is to do a good work in you and finish it, then the work is right. If his good pleasure is that he purposed in himself to make known the mysteries of his will, it is right. If it please, it, it actually has pleased God to save men. Now, you have to have a proper view of God. You have to see him. Some people have this, this idea that God is just wrathful. He's wrathful and he's just set to, to find a reason to condemn people. And then you have the others over here that say, well, he's not that way. He's just completely loving, and, and he would never do anything to hurt you. Well, they're both true, aren't they? They're, God, God is a compli he's complicated. He's not, he's not a simplistic being. And so you have to be able to know what the pleasure of the Lord is. He sent his only begotten son. So he desires a people for himself. This is his pleasure. He wants a people for himself. And Jesus is the pleasure of God the Father because he did all of the pleasure of the Father. Have you ever thought that you bring pleasure to God? Those who are in Christ Jesus. You bring pleasure to the Lord. He finds delight in his people because they're walking in his ways and they have a mind like he has and they have desires like he has. And this brings pleasure to the Lord. It is because he is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. So what of our pleasures can we fully carry out? What things can we purpose and then fully carry them out? God determines his purpose and then he fulfills it, fulfills his purpose because of his pleasure. This is what he wants. This is what he desires. So brethren, God's people are able to say this. This is found in Revelation. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. 
And so, brethren, my exhortation to you this morning before Brother Ricky comes up is believe. Believe. Have faith and believe. Because when you believe God, you are right in line with the will of his pleasure and his purpose. Amen. Amen. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. We have in this text an excellent perspective of free will. Since men are so prone to talk about free will, okay, we'll talk about it. Let's look at it from this perspective. Free will is the person who is able to purpose to do what he wants and is able to do everything that he wants to do without hindrance. And if you can do that, you have free will. You see, God is the only one that can do all that he intends to do. The immutability of his counsel is owing to the fact that he is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And there is no man that has all power. All men have borrowed power, and it is always restricted. It is always in measure. Man has not been created to be omnipotent, and even when you're glorified, you will not be omnipotent. You have been made to be subservient to God. I understand that this is greatly difficult for sinful men to come to this reality. It is uncomfortable to think this way, that things are out of their control, and that they are, are subject to one who is greater than they are, but that is the reality of our text. No man can take unto his mouth and say, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Although men have said that in one way or another, it is a sinful thing to do. Maybe you have heard the statement like this, you can do anything you put your mind to. Really? Can you? Have you been able to yet do anything, everything that you have put your mind to? God can do anything that he puts his mind to. Amen. Have you ever heard men say things like this? You are in control of your own destiny. Is that true? Are you? Are you really? You cannot go a day without your desire being frustrated in one way or another. That's the reality. You know, it's a strange thing to me. When disasters come, that men didn't know were going to come and do devastation that is beyond their control as they run and flee for their lives, that after that destruction comes, they tend to boast as if they'll have control over things. <laughs> kind of like the Israelites did when God would bring judgment against them. The bricks are falling down, but we will rebuild. You know those words were said at the ground level of ground zero? Those very words quoted by the leaders of this country. Men talk real big after difficulty. It is a strange thing. It ought to be the time when they are most humbled, when they couldn't predict the coming of the storm and couldn't stop it from doing everything that it had intended to do and are simply trying to recover from the rubble that they couldn't control. But they talk big. They did it in Joplin, too. The slogans were going around, we're going to rebuild and we're going to be stronger. Are you? That's like saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. When God destroys, you do not have the prerogative to rebuild. It is a strange thing, the pride of life. The belief that any man can chart their own course and do as they please without being in subjection to God, that is the pride of life. And it's evil. The Speak Life Pentecostal movement, I'm afraid, is too close to this kind of very thing. They believe they can take this divine prerogative of omnipotence unto themselves and do what they want just by speaking a word. Can they? Oh, they can say it all day long. My counsel shall stand and I shall do all my pleasure, but it's nothing but pretension and it is pathetic in the heavenly places. 
James chapter 4, verse 13 to 15, there were believers who were dealing with this very thing, acting this way. And James was able to dress it and spearhead this because this is offensive to God when men talk this way. Yeah. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Will you? Will you? Haven't you purposed things like this that have fallen through? Mm -hmm. Things you didn't plan for financially that happened. Yeah. You wouldn't have wished them on yourself, but they came nonetheless. God never has anything that he wishes that doesn't come to pass. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't have any control over tomorrow, so don't pretend like you have any measure of control today. You don't. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanish away. For that, that is in view of this, you remember Moses prayed, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. It's not wise to speak as if your counsel shall stand and you'll do all your pleasure. Consider that your life is a vapor and it will encourage you to think soundly before the living God, the only true living God. All life that we have is borrowed life. It comes from God, but God does not have borrowed life. He is a self-existent one. Amen. He is the everlasting one. But we are not. The pride of life is a terrible thing. In Isaiah 46, God is showing contempt for false gods. You remember for a while, Israel wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to serve wood and they wanted to serve stone. In fact, that's why Israel went into Assyria into captivity is because of their service of false gods. So he said, okay, I'll cast you out of my sight. He sent Israel into Assyria, and he sent Judah in captivity unto Babylon. And it looked when Nebuchadnezzar rolled into Jerusalem and besieged the city, it looked like he had all power and control. It looked as if Nebuchadnezzar could do all his counsel. It did look that way. That's what he did. He did. He rolled in there. Everything he wanted to do, he did. He even went into the temple plundering these precious and holy things. You remember his grandson was the one that took those precious things and attributed to false gods by the use of these holy things. It looked by all appearance that the God of the Jews was less powerful than Baal and Nebo. But God mocks these gods. Bel boweth down, Nebo stupid, their idols were upon the beasts and upon the cattle. In other words, they were carted off. Nobody carts God off. Amen. Nobody carries God, brother. Nobody does that. That's a that's crazy notion. Your carriages were heavy loaden, they were a burden to the weary beasts. In other words, they didn't have any help from the false gods. See, they're heavy, heavy gods made of stone overlaid with gold and silver. Gold and silver was actually the weakness of the false gods. That's why they were taken. Astounding. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden. But themselves are gone into captivity. There goes Baal. There goes Nebo. Here's God declaring the end from the beginning right here. God's got a man he's going to bring from a far off nation named Cyrus. And that Persian is going to roll in and do what he wants. And any notion of sovereignty and omnipotence that you might see in Babylon is going to go away. And the false gods couldn't keep them. Couldn't do it. You know what a false god is? It's simply an attempt by men to free themselves from subjection to the one true and living God and take unto themselves the prerogatives of divine sovereignty and omnipotence. That is what that is. It is always pride to do something like this. By whatever means it's done, it may be an intellectual God like we have today. Strange thing to believe in a God. That's a strange thing. I'm a reasonable man. Really. It's never reasonable to deny the existence of the living God. That's never reasonable. 
There's all kinds of gods out there, but it's simply men trying to deny the reality of the one true God in whom all men must bow the knee. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. In fact, the reason why Israel went into Babylon in the first place, God says, man up, in verse 9. You didn't go there because I was overthrown. I sent you there because of transgression. That's why you went. Well, they got the lesson, you know. They weren't idolaters anymore. Praise God for that. You see, false gods are as powerless as the men who have fashioned them. That is why God mocks them. Because men put their trust in a piece of wood by which they warm the fire and warm themselves and make a meal for themselves and use the other part to fashion a god. And they bow down to a tree. It's a strange notion. But men were captivated by false gods for thousands of years. Paul had to deal with that, didn't he? A professing believers that didn't know there was one God. I think of the way that God has mocked the false gods. Remember Elijah? There he stood. There he stood before all these prophets of Baal. The challenge is set forth. They both built an altar. And the challenge was... Whichever one is the true God, let him answer with fire. And so remember, the prophets of Baal, boy, they started from the morning and they went all the way to noon, crying out. They made a lot of noise. A lot of noise took place while Elijah patiently waited and waited and waited until he could not help himself. He had to go to mocking. Cry aloud, for he's a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or preventure he sleepeth, or must be awakened. Cry louder. Elijah was simply God speaking through Elijah to show his people the absurdity of bowing down to a God that isn't a true God. I love the mocking. Remember when Dagon, the God of the Philistines, there they put the ark right next to Dagon. They wake up the next morning and dug on his face to the ground. The appropriate image for a false god, God doesn't bow down to anybody. But God is the God of gods, and all false gods bow down to him. They came in the following day, and he lost his hands and his head. He lost his head, brethren. Why? Because a false god can't do anything. A false god cannot determine anything. A false god is simply the making of the one who fashioned it. The one who fashioned it ascribes to it its purpose. The one who fashioned it ascribes to it its character. God tells Israel, what kind of likeness are you going to make me in? You didn't fashion me. And verse 3 says, I fashioned you. I made you. I brought you from the womb. Right? I love these mockings. I think they're wonderful. I'm glad God mocks the false gods. I was getting supercharged when I was listening to God. The scriptures talk about these false gods. Their writers are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. And the bottom line is, the false God is no powerful than the person that made it. Amen. You see, here it is, brethren. Men are not comfortable with their powerlessness. That is why when they are apprised of it, they speak so big. But it doesn't matter. Consider our powerlessness just in simple things, brethren. We aspire to come to the meeting, and what happens? We get sick. Did you want to get sick? No, but it came on you against your will, right? You want to come? Has anyone ever missed the meeting because you've been sick? Who hasn't? We can't even exercise our will in small matters. We're running late for work. We got to get there, and what happens? You hit every red light in town trying to get there, and you end up being late. You can't even control the lights in town. And to keep them green so you get there on time. 
Hey, I know, these, these, are, these, are, these are funny, but these are little things that help us to understand you cannot take up into your mouth, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure, even in spiritual things, brethren. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit lusteth against the flesh, so that what? You are not able to do that which you would. You have great and high aspirations, you want to be productive for the Lord, but some days you give yourself more to the fighting of the flesh than you would like to, and you are not as productive as you would want to be. That's just the way it is. Because you can't exercise your will uncontested. You can't. Now I'm saying this, brother, not to beat us down. Of course, you know when God beats you down, it's so he can lift you up. So don't be discouraged when you get beat down. God does it so he can lift you up, and so here's the good word. It's good to know that you can trust in a God who can do all that he wants to do. Amen. The way that you will guarantee that you will not be disappointed ultimately is by wanting what God wants. God. Amen. That's what salvation is all about. It's getting us on the same page with God so that yeah. you want what God wants because that's the only way you'll not be disappointed and surprised and frustrated. That's the only way. God's will is the only will that is going to stand. God is the only one that is going to be able to do all his pleasure and if you want to not be disappointed, trust in God. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Well, every man that puts their trust in him is going to find that word to be true. The immutability of God's counsel is owing to the fact that he's omnipotent. God doesn't just have most power. God has all power. It's just not that God is big. He has all power. He has all power. That's what omnipotence is. There is no power but of God. He has all power. Every power that is has its origin in God. That's so important to see that. And so here the immutability count of his counsel isn't owing to the fact that he doesn't change. It's owing to the fact that he can do all that he intends to do without being frustrated. My counsel shall stand... I will do all my pleasure. Now let's look at the sovereignty of God because this is such an important thing for people to see this and understand this about God. That God does everything he wants to do. Think of God's name. Brother Gibbon already mentioned this. Melchizedek gave this testimony. Abraham gave the testimony right after him. God is the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. So no man really has anything they can call their own. Say, but I made this. Yeah, but who did you get the resources from? The possessor of heaven and earth. The Lord in the midst of the earth. That's who he is. The God of the spirits of all flesh. Ask Ananias and Sapphira about that. Do you have the ability to call someone's spirit out of the earth? God can do it at will. And they both fell down dead. He called their spirit to himself. Yes. I'll tell you, that makes, very, that makes you very sober. Amen. Amen. That makes you very sober. The God of gods and the Lord of lords. Are there lords in the earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we call them governors. You know, we call them governors. Some of them we call presidents. We call them different things. But there is a lord over those lords. Right. A great God. I like that. He's a great God. Brother Jeremy reminds us of that all the time. He's a great God. A mighty, a terrible. Ooh, yeah, terrible. Terrible. Even godly people, when there was a manifestation of a likeness of God in the forms of like angelic servants whom he sent forth as a flaming fire, they say he's going to kill us. We're dead. And it wasn't even the full revelation of the living God like Manoah and his wife. That's our God for you. He is the most high. He's the most high. He is the true God. In other words, he is everything that he has represented himself to be. Yes. Remember, I'm just giving you what God said. Yeah. I'm not giving you my opinion here. This is what the word says. He is the living God. Consider his rule, brethren. Job chapter 25, verse 2 and 3. It's astounding what men knew that didn't have the Bible. 
So much for the, the notion, you know, that we're getting a lot wiser in our thinking as we go along. Job did a lot without a Bible, didn't he? Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. That means anything that happens in the earth is affected from heavenly places. So important that men see that. Is there any number of his armies? Is there? Now he didn't say, is there any number in his army? He said, is there any number of his armies? Armies. Do you know how many armies God has in heavenly places? Do you know how many? I know that Jesus talked about, the, remember the legions that he said could be available to him? I mean, that wasn't like the emptying of heaven, brethren. I got an idea that was probably like half of maybe one army. We don't know how many armies God has, but we know this. He does have them. And he marshals them at will to do what he wants. This is a wonderful thing to see. The kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. God reigneth over the heathen. How about that word? Whether they want him to or not, it doesn't matter. He reigns over the heathen. And by the way, God does command all men everywhere to repent. Don't give men the idea that they have the option to repent or not. No, God demands that you do it. You better repent. Because God reigns over the heathen. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Can't do it. Remember who said that? But it wasn't Daniel. You remember who gave that testimony? Nebuchadnezzar himself when he came back. That's what he said. And I'll tell you, if God can do whatever he wants in heaven, he's certainly not going to have any difficulty doing what he wants in the earth. Amen. Consider them that attend his service. How many servants do you have? How many people attend to your will? How about this one? I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Millions and millions minister to do his will. They are at his beck and call. At any moment, he wants them. And that's just in heaven. These are the kind of things that we have to think about, brother, when we think about the idea of his counsel standing and him do all his pleasure. God always uses a means to do what he does. He's got an innumerable company to do what he wants them to do. Amen. That's good to know when you realize that they are sent to serve thus who shall should be the heirs of salvation. Well, this is... This is good news. Consider his power in creation. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Ever killed a grasshopper without knowing it? Oops, ooh, I didn't see it. It's the kind of power God wields. That stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, spreadeth them out as a tent that do, to dwell in. God looks at the earth, and you know what he sees? A tent. Something easily put in your car, something easily carted off to somewhere, quickly put together, put out, quickly unpacked. That's God. Men don't see the earth as a tent or they wouldn't put their trust in it. But it's a tent. You know, one day Jesus is going to come and roll it up as a scroll. It's just something light. That's what a curtain is. It's just something that's light, easily parted, unpacked. That's what a tent is. Just pack it right up and go, that's God. Consider his infinite wisdom. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. Put the earth under a microscope, and the borders of human wisdom run out while the borders of God's wisdom run on. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. It is. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You remember who said that? It wasn't some running dummy. It's one of the smartest men that we have ever known, the Apostle Paul. And when a wise man takes an assessment of a wise God, he says, I've only seen the hem of the garment. Mm -hmm. That's all I've seen. 
You see, I'm showing you a God who is fully able to do everything that he wants to do. Amen. His sovereignty enables him to make his counsel to stand and to do all his pleasure. That's our God. Amen. That's our God. God has the power and wisdom to do whatever he purposes to do. Remember when those men on that stormy sea, there they were with Jonah. You've got to be careful with who you are, who you're with, who's your company, who's with you. Big old storm stirred up there. Jonah was running from God, but God has a way of seeing to it that you get where he wants you to get. Yeah. Stirred up a storm, a tempestuous and fearful storm. And you remember they were in search. Why is the storm here? At least they had enough understanding to realize that storms are not the product of Mother Nature. There is a God that's doing this. Yeah. And so they cast lots and it fell to Jonah. So Jonah said, just cast me overboard. And as soon as they did, the storm was quiet. You remember what those men said? You remember what they said? O oh Lord, thou hast done as it has pleased thee. Yeah. Hmm? That's our God. God does whatever he wants to do. God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That's our God. God does exactly what he wants to do. Now, what does God want to do? I'll tell you, when you realize that you don't have the power and that God has all the power and that you are completely subject to his will, you really want to know what is his will. Uh -huh. I want to know exactly what his will is. What pleases him? What is God's counsel that's going to stand? Well, first let's understand this, that all things that were created, as Sister Tasha said, all things that were created were created for his pleasure. So while men are off talking about how God can bring their pleasures to pass, God is saying, no, you were made for my pleasure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Praise God. And God is not at a distance watching his creation. Yeah. No. The sons of men are part of his possession. And they were created to bring pleasure to God Almighty. Just knowing that is encouraging. God didn't make men so he'd be displeased with them. He made them for his pleasure. Amen. It's good to know. God's not indifferent to what men do. God is not indifferent to what men say. False gods do not have ears, but God does have ears. False gods do not have eyes, but God has eyes. And he sees all things. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. For what purpose? To get pleasure. And that's why he's considering them, carefully considering them. God's not indifferent to his creation, brethren. He is not. No, he is watching them. He is trying them. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. He's always got an assessment for men. Let me ask you something. Do your ways please the Lord? Because God responds to both what pleases him and to what displeases him. Amen. A God who has pleasure also correspondingly has displeasure. And if we can understand what he delights in, it helps us to understand what he doesn't delight in. Amen. When Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, it displeased God and he killed them for it. When the inclination of every man's heart in the days of Noah was only evil continually, it pained him in his heart, and he destroyed the earth as a result. When David said, thy will, that's what I want to do. I want to do your will. Hmm? I delight in your commandments. God was pleased in him, and he set him on a throne. When Solomon asked for wisdom to manage the people, God was pleased with him, and he did something about what he was pleased with. When an Ananias and Sapphira lied, God was displeased with that, and he did something with his displeasure. This is the way our God is. He is either pleased with you, or he is displeased with you. That's the way you have to see him. Because all, God always does something with what he's displeased with, and always does something with what he's pleased with. He tries the sons of men. 
He looks at everything they do. Now, when you're, when you're in salvation, this is an encouragement. You're glad for that. Because I don't want you to think of God as merely a reactionary. That's not what we have here. Remember, this is the God that has a counsel. Yes. He's not a divine reactionary sitting up in heaven and just kind of reacting to men. That's not what it is at all. Amen. There is something that compels God to do all that he does. There is a prevailing desire that moves God to do everything that he does. Amen. And when I looked in the scriptures, I just looked at what pleased him, what delighted him, and I found a very consistent theme, and it is this, righteousness. That's the thing that God loves. The righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His, counts, his countenance doth behold the upright. God says, drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. See, this is, if I can say this in a human way, this is the thing that refreshes God. Righteousness. It's good to behold it in the earth, see? Righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Righteousness is what he loves. Think of some of the examples that we find in the scriptures, okay? How about when a person is willing to do what is right? I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. Yes, when the amen. people were willing, they had a mind to work, do the will of God, build the temple. The man of God could be confident that God was pleased with what's going on. When you want to do what is right, know this, that God is affected by that for good. Yeah. Because he loves righteousness. Mm -hmm. How about being separate? We're told all the time today, we're told if you haven't heard it, surely you've heard this, to kind of mingle with the ungodly. And as if somehow our unrighteousness gives us some kind of edge in being evangelistic to the ungodly. It seems to me it's what they don't have that you do have that should draw them to you, right? God is pleased with separateness. Now, therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves. That's what pleased him. That word separate, holiness, Amen. that's what pleases God. Yes. Is when you don't go in the counsel of the wicked, but you go against the counsel of the wicked. That's what pleases him. Separateness. Another thing that pleases God is doing his commandments because they are right. Remember David saying that, thy commandments, they are right. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. That's what a minister is. Don't tell me a man's a minister that despises the commandments of God. No, he's not a minister. No, that's a false teacher. Are you doing the commandments of God? Do you love them? Do you keep them? That's pleasing to God because it's righteousness and God loves his righteousness. How about repentance? Have I any pleasure that at all? Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Does God have pleasure in the death of the wicked? What does he have pleasure in? that a man repents and turns from his wickedness. Do you know God still finds pleasure in that? Yeah. When an ungodly man turns, what do the angels do? Rejoice. Amen. When the prodigal came back from being a prodigal, what did the father do? He saw him coming from a distance mm -hmm. and he closed the distance between him and the prodigal. Yeah. You know, God did that for me and he did that for you. It is the mercies of the Lord that we are not consumed. Amen. Repentance is a righteous act. Right. And when you see men doing it, give thanks to God. Amen. But God loves that because he loves righteousness. How about those that fear him and hope in his mercy? The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. You know it's a righteous thing to do that? Yes. Amen. It's right for you to fear God. It's best that you don't call to God daddy. It's not right. It is best that you fear him. 
Say, we ought not to fear God. God finds pleasure in it. Plug your ears. Don't listen to men when they talk like that. Whatever God finds pleasure in, that's what we want to be doing. Amen. And if you fear him, that is to say that your life, you have orchestrated your life and shaped it around what God is doing. That's the fear of the Lord. And God is pleased with that. You know why? Because it's an act of righteousness and God loves righteousness. But now here's the dilemma. Among the human race, naturally, there is none of us that is righteous. No man can repent naturally. No man can love the commandments of God by nature. They don't come to this by nature. Men do not fear God naturally. Being a son of Adam gives you a great disadvantage in believing in God. That's right, Brother Gibbon. That is, that is the thing that is difficult, is to believe and trust God when things are completely out of your control and you still have your eye on the one in whom is everything under control. That is a difficult thing to do. I don't care who you are. It doesn't mean you're unbelieving. It just means you got flesh. And as long as you got flesh, you're going to have to say things like this. When I am afraid, I will trust in thee. You got to deal with it. I'm showing you something that God delights in, and yet it's impossible for men to do this. How are we going to get these things reconciled? How is a man going to hope in God when he can't do what pleases God? But God must, God must deal with what displeases him and with what pleases him. How is this going to happen? Because there's none righteous, no, not one. You know, when, uh, when Israel went down, when, actually when the camp of Judah went down into Babylon, it was completely out of their control. But in Isaiah 46, one of the things that God is doing is trying to instill hope and encouragement to them that he has not utterly forsaken them and cut them off. That's why he reminds them that he had taken them from the womb. That's why he reminds them of that. And that he'll keep them unto the hoary hairs. He wants to instill hope in them. So you know what he says? Do the best you can down there. Try and get out if you can. What does he say? He says... I have a man. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. You do not have the ability to bring forth the work of righteousness that pleases God, but there is a man that does. Amen. Amen. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, and rivers of water in a dry place, and the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the wrath shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerer shall be ready to speak plainly. Indeed, the human race has been debilitated by its unrighteousness, but God has a man. He has a man fit for blind people. He has a man fit for dumb people. He has a man fit for men who do not have the power to do what pleases God. God is not an austere person. He has sent a man to do his counsel. You know, every time God has forwarded his counsel, he has always done it with one man. He populated the entire race of the world through Adam. Through one man, when it was time to bring his people up and deliver them from Egypt, he sent one man down there to do that. And this one man was faithful in all his house. When he opened the shadows of what God intended to do, it was necessary that they be absolutely precise. And he was faithful in all that God gave him to do. One man. And when God wanted to send a predecessor for Jesus Christ, he sent John the Baptist. He didn't send a company. He sent a man. That's our God. You see, God will never rest the integrity of his word on a fallen man. He will certainly not rest it on a nation. This is so the promise will be sure to all the seed. It rests in the hands of one man. To bring forth in a people the work of righteousness. 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, for a king to rule in righteousness, for him to have a scepter that he wills that is a scepter of righteousness. Why has he been anointed above his fellows? Because he know to choose the good and to refuse the evil. Jesus can't give you what he doesn't have. But he's a righteous man. In fact, he's the righteous one. It's so important that we consider the credentials of the Son of God. Here's God's testimony of him. We believe the counsel of God. Here's what God said about the Son of God. He shall not fail. That's what God said about him. Tell me, do you know anything that concerns the will of God that Jesus has yet dropped and failed to do? Hmm? God sent him into the world to uphold righteousness and to declare the righteousness of the living God. And when Jesus came to the end of life, he said, Satan hath nothing in me. He may have something in us, but he didn't have anything in Jesus. God gave him the order to lay down his life and to take it up again. Did he do it? Yes, he did. You see, Jesus will not fail in anything that God has sent him to do. Jesus knows that God loves righteousness. Jesus knows God's counsel is that God have a people for himself, a righteous people, that they might all be righteous. When Jesus is done with them, they will all be righteous. He is a fit cornerstone. He is a tried stone. He has been tried in the realm in which we are working out our salvation. He came out spotless. And through the spirit of holiness, he was raised from the dead. That's Jesus. Consider his perfect righteousness, who being in brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. You see, there are some aspects of God that we see in us, but every aspect of God is seen in him. God says, or remember Jesus said to Philip, if thou hast seen me, thou hast seen the Father. That was a comprehensive statement of the righteousness of God. You've seen it all in me. These are, these are high things. You understand God's righteousness is a high thing. The, the difficulty with what you have grappled with understanding these things tells you how high it is. So don't be discouraged. When he died, he satisfied God. Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You know how we know the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand? Because he died. Because he made intercession for the transgressors. You see, you have to bear the false God. But the true God bears the people. He even bears their iniquities and carries their sorrows. And he did. He did, brethren. Consider his great power, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Jesus wields the same power that God has always had. Thy throne, O God, is forever. You will grapple with seeing that every day. But, uh, but thank God you can see it. I'm not saying you can't. Consider his wisdom. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They're hid in him. If you need wisdom, you just ask of God, and he gives liberally and does not abrade you. Aren't you continually growing in your understanding of the things of God? Your continual growth in wisdom, the expansion of your understanding of these things. We have brethren here who have been in the Lord for a great many years, and yet we find them still coming to new and fresh things. It's a testimony to the infinite wisdom that's found in Christ. And by that wisdom, brethren, He's going to make a people for himself. Now, the best testimony and the credentials that I can give you for Christ are simply this, and this is just the way the Lord has led me to do this, is to consider his work. What's his work? We are. We are the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So if Jesus really is working righteousness and he's working in people, then we should be able to behold that work in progress in the people he has saved. Remember, all these people were taken from the pit like David was, every one of them. None of them were righteous when Jesus found them. None of us were righteous when Jesus 
found us. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? But look at the chains that's being wrought. Consider Peter. Peter was presumptuous only because he was ignorant. Though all forsake thee, I will never leave thee. Well, remember what Jesus said. Not quite so. Satan has desired to sift thee. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, so that when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. There he stood on the day of Pentecost after that great lamentation that night when he stood before the Lord, when he looked at him and gave a great word, and 3,000 came to the Lord. Have you not been strengthened by the words of Peter? It is a living testimony not to the greatness of Peter, but to the greatness of Christ in Peter. When thou art converted, he's been granted to give repentance. He grants repentance. Jesus does this. Men can't do this, but Jesus does this. Paul went down on the road of Damascus. He was a self-righteous man. He served God, I understand, in all good conscience. I'm not slinging mud on God's people. I'm just telling you this is how God found them. They aren't righteous of their own. Men don't have a righteousness of their own. So that's not what I'm doing here. But he went away saved by Jesus. Not only did he never persecute the church again, but he was one of the greatest helpers of their joy. Who was that? That was Jesus. That was Christ in him, the hope of glory. That was a manifestation of righteousness. God found Lydia. You remember the scripture says that he opened her heart that she might attend to the word. It's a right thing to love what God has said. She did. Who did that? The Lord did that. It's important, brethren, when you look on a righteous man to not think that any man is righteous of himself. He's not. This is the work of Jesus in men, to make them righteous. How about doing righteousness? Is it possible to be consistent? I've just got a few more things and I'll be done, okay? Just a few more things. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer, praying for you, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The Thessalonians, they turned to God for miles to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. The apostle Paul came to the end of his life, showing forth great faithfulness because of the work of Christ in him and said, I fought a good fight, I finished the race. Yeah. Now I show you all these things to simply tell you this. God loves righteousness. God's made a people for his own pleasure. God's in absolute control. He has everything he needs to see to it that men are righteous and completely righteous in the end. But he's not entrusted that responsibility to men. He has given it to the Son. And Jesus is making that happen to those who put their trust in him. So let me encourage you to do this. Jesus said this word. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. What is that? That's the fruit of righteousness. Do you want to be very fruitful? The kind of fruit that God can receive, the kind of fruit that pleases him? Yeah. Jesus will work that in you if you trust him and if you abide in him. This is the man that's going to execute his full counsel and see to it that in the end, God is not frustrated in anything that he has desired. Amen. Jesus is one day going to say, it's I and the children which thou hast given me. He's going to finish the work. He's going to do it. And so I'll just leave you with this one text. Thy people also, and this is, this is the counsel of God. Thy people also shall be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands that I may be glorified. Thank you, brother. Amen.